Hello, everyone. I'm Susan Nash, AAPG. I'm delighted to be here today. We have a rather record-breaking type of uh, event. It's first time ever, and it's um, a co-production of our Division of Professional Affairs and also the Division of Environmental Geologists. And it, the topic is orphan wells. And we're going to talk about plugging and abandoning, adhering to best practices, funds, tax credits for monitoring, eliminating emissions. But basically today is an overview. And the structure will be, we'll have brief inter introductions, then we'll have about 15 minutes a piece for the, um, for the presenters. And then we will have, um, we will have a chance to have questions and answers after the um, after our technical presentation is over. So our core pre presenters are Dan Arthur of ALL Consulting, Bert Vogler of Kleinfelder, Dennis Wiles of Newpoint Energy, and then Nileva Radonjic will be uh, speaking briefly to talk about part two, which will really emphasize the cementing, plugging techniques, best practices. We'll also have people from the USGS next time to talk about specific programs, et cetera. So I'm really happy to introduce people. Right now I'm going to uh, invite Hannes Leiteru, who's our DEG president, to speak. Hey, <clears throat> just wanted to give you a quick background on Division of Environmental Geology. DG members use their knowledge of subsurface geology to help understand environmental impacts that include water resources, orphan wells, and storage, among other things. Storage, which is expanding all the time, includes carbon capture utilization and storage, hydrogen storage, compressed air energy storage, geothermal storage, and natural gas storage. Petroleum geologists are uniquely qualified to evaluate the risk and uncertainty of subsurface storage system. For example, what is the leakage risk and induced seismicity risk during injection? But in this part of the seminar, we're talking about what is the impact of these abandoned wells on injection programs is one of the things that DEG will be looking at. And now I'll go on with the program. Well, thank you. So our first presenter is Dan Arthur. So I'd like to invite Dan to, to share his screen and, and um, welcome. Good, so are we ready to go, Susan? It looks good. Okay. So uh, I'm gonna give you, a, a, I would say a very short presentation. Uh, as, as Susan noted, we only have about 15 minutes. This is a, a, a big issue. I've got a lot of pictures in here of uh, historic things and, and I'm gonna run through some issues. At the end of my presentation will be my contact information, email, cell phone. So feel free to contact me uh, as desired. But, but today we're going to be talking about uh, orphan and abandoned wells. Uh, so, so not just the old ones, even ones that are post-1950. But I'd say that a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today will focus on historic wells. So from, a, from an overall Set of the presentation, we're going to look at you know defining you know some of these OAWs locations, locating them, methane emissions and carbon credits, risks and planning. I will tell you that that one of my main uh, priorities is really risk management and safety. I do a lot of expert witness testimony, and I would just prefer not to do uh, too many more cases that involve fatalities or injuries or or significant damage to uh, to infrastructure or land. So um, that's one of the priorities of, of why I'm here today, uh, as well as the carbon credits to, to have an inspiration to get these things done. So, you know, you'll see a number of photos, as I, as I noted here, of old historic sites um, that what you see in the field can be very diverse. But, you know, what are these wells? So, you know, the OAWs uh, can be can be a variety of different things, but they're abandoned wells. Maybe that you know they're not being maintained in accordance with current or prevailing uh, 
uh, state or federal regulatory statutes. Um, these are generally wells that don't have an operator. The operator is gone or bankrupt or whatever. And then we have orphan wells that, you know, may have been drilled in the late 1800s or early 1900s or something that that just have many don't even have a record. Um, you know, when you look at at just what these what these were, it's it's incredible. Um, the 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 picture here in the bottom right is is from New York from their orphan well program. What they've confirmed, we'll see some more of that. But I can tell you, there's there's a lot of wells out there. So the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission through a DOE grant has been doing some fabulous work on looking at orphan wells, some of their statuses, where they are, um, helping to helping states to try to prioritize plugging based on a number of factors, identifying those by state. So, you know, the the top map was prepared by the Environmental Defense Fund. So they're doing a lot and being very involved in this as well, which I think is great. Uh, and as you can see, these walls are not just put to one location. They're, they're in a lot of places. Pennsylvania, some of the older areas uh, have the most, but, um, but I can tell you that overall, historically, there's been over 5 million oil and gas wells drilled in the United States of America. Um, and we're showing discrepancies even here where EDF is, is showing 81,000 wells. IOGCC identified 131,000. Um, my guess, you know, I've heard numbers uh, in excess of a million. So this is a significant thing for us to try to address. Now, as you look at locating orphan and abandoned wells, it's it's more complex than you think because, you know, I have a I have a, a a property in eastern Ohio that's on Stumptown Road because back when oil was being developed, they, they cut all the trees down because they needed wood to build derricks and other infrastructure. Um, and now there's trees grown there. So you see a lot of wells that are out in the middle of the woods, um, or maybe a river has shifted. The, the bottom center is the Wabash River, a well we had to plug back in the 80s. Um, but you can also see areas like Kiefer where you see a lot of wells there and it's difficult to identify those. And we'll talk about some more details of that as we go forward here. With that said, and I've got a couple of slides here I want to, I really want to focus on because I think they don't get enough attention is there really is a lot of historic information, historic maps, old records, old field investigations, um, you know, companies like Marathon uh, keep keep historic records housed in under temperature control so they can get to those. Um, so there's a lot of records out there that, that are accessible that can really help you understand, you know, where their gas zones intersected uh, and so forth. And I'll also say that that one of my key instruments, and there's there's a number of things that can be used, is a FLIR camera. We found wells um, by looking in fields and forests and, and you know, mountainsides with a FLIR camera by seeing emissions. So you might go find a well like in that top picture and, and then under a FLIR camera and see that it's emitting methane. So you can use it both to get to gain some kind of insights towards how much methane is being emitted, but you can also use a FLIR camera for identifying and finding these wells. So there's a lot of methods being used out there in trying to find and identify these, not only the records that I talked about, but these are a couple of pictures from, uh, from both the, the state of Ohio and the state of New York where they're using magnetometers. Uh, this has some really good stuff and, and there's been a lot of success in identifying a lot of wells. Um, these magnetometers can find and identify wells that have steel casing probably no, no greater than say 10 to 15 feet below ground surface. Uh, and then, you know, if you go to plugging, you may have to get more detailed with, uh, with hand instruments and so forth, uh, FLIR cameras and the like. But, but these are being, I'd say, extremely helpful and the states and, and other companies out doing this work has had a lot of success in finding wells they really didn't know existed. Now, as we look at, at methane emissions, you know, I, I tell people, and, and it sounds it sounds maybe harsh, but um, 
it's it's sometimes difficult to to realize that there can be uh, emissions and we can't see them. So you can't see normal methane emissions. And I know that sounds silly, but uh, it's 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 significant. And so you need to be careful around some of these old wells. We've seen some that have had significant emissions, and I'll show you a picture um, of a site in New York here shortly, but. Um, but as you're going out and doing this work and looking for wells and so forth, I would just say be safe, you know, have an LEL meter on you uh, and, and, and be, be cautious. So, uh, but like I said, you know, some of these you find in the middle woods, you might fall over one when you find it. So this is, this is kind of an extreme case, but uh, this is, you know, from the state of New York, their, their orphan well plugging program, but this is a site in Oneida County, in New York. Um, that you can see from aerial photography, um, as you can see on the on the upper left. But this is a site that had both salt water, um, um, you know, emitting from the well uh, and gas. And one of the issues that they had over the years is that people would would trespass on this property and set it on fire. So it would, you know, things you know, you'd have. Uh, fires, you know, in, in this and so forth, which only expanded uh, the, the environmental impact. So, so just keep in mind, as we get into these wells, it can get complicated and be more than just a well sitting in the middle of a field or a forest. The other thing I think that's, that's carrying greater uh, significance uh, to this program that I'm very excited about is the idea of carbon credits uh, relative to plugging these old wells. So we have a lot of wells with methane emissions that are greenhouse gas. Um, there's there's the, the, the opportunity to, uh, to take advantage of, of carbon credits by addressing this. There's one registry right now, the American Carbon Registry, that has a single option for both pre and post abandonment measurement. Um, but there's a number of others that are, that are being looked at, tested, and developed. Uh, as well as a new carbon registry focused on uh, orphan and abandoned wells and carbon credits and selling those credits on a, on a global basis. Uh, we're working on that, on that methodology and assisting the, um, the registry. So I, we'll, we'll see that soon. Um, but but the, the, I think the most positive part of this is that when you offer those sorts of incentives, uh, it can help some of these wells get plugged. And I know that the, the federal government is, is providing significant funds uh, to states to, to plug wells, but when you really think about the number of wells that there may be out there, uh, that's, that's a far cry from what's really, it's gonna be required to address all these wells. So the other thing, that, that, that I mentioned early on was managing risks and safety. And I would just say, and, and I'll talk about this on the next slide, that things weren't done in the past like they are now. So these slides to the right are examples of what they call stovepipe casing. This is casing that was driven in the ground, doesn't have cement behind it. If you were producing through stovepipe casing, you had to put the perforations in the casing before you ran it into the ground. These were hand perforated um, and then driven in the ground. So if you come back 100 years later, later to try to plug one of these wells, um, you, can, you may experience uh, cross-contamination or cross-flow between different formations, gas migration, a number of different things that you have to plan for that simply weren't thought about uh, in the very early 1900s, late 1800s. People were looking for oil. Uh, so gas was just a nuisance. Um, I'd also say that, you know, the, the Safe Drinking Water Act wasn't uh, initiated in, until 1974. So how we thought about fresh water and water to be protected was very different. So lots of considerations to be, to be keenly aware of. So, and, and that's part of why I'm saying this, and, and I've got some, some slides here, just, just keep in mind, understanding history is critical. And too often times, um, we approach some of these wells through our, our 2022 goggles on, looking at it, thinking that, that the way things were done then are the same that they are now. And there were standard practices that were, that were common at different 
different periods of time, um, but uh, but things also varied considerably depending on where you were, what fields you were, you know, Kern River versus LA Basin versus, you know, Eastern Ohio versus Texas or, or whatever. So, so you, if you're going to get into this, uh, this business and really start looking at these and understanding them and, and providing solid plugging practices that are actually going to stop the methane from being emitted, you've really got to, you've really got to look at a, a pretty broad variety of, of issues. I will also say that um, that looking at the wells alone is not the end of the story. These these two center pictures are from a site we did remedial work at in, in South Central Kansas. Um, but you know this was areas with central pumping units that helped us actually locate the wells. But you you had all sorts of equipment. Plus we had salt scarring. We had um, you know, oil uh, that had impacted the soil. So we used bioremediation, phytoremediation, uh, a number of things beyond just the, the plugging of the well itself. So, so think about that. The other thing I'll, I'll point out is, you know, this, this, this book cover on the right is from 1974. There's another API document uh, that, uh, that I was able to help with back in my EPA days. Uh, that I think was published in 1992, uh, looking at, at at well plugging and, and especially with focus on uh, abandoned orphan well. So there's resources out there that go back and, and look at this and talk about some of the considerations that you should take in mind. So as you do this, please please use those resources that are available. The other thing I'll notice, and this is I had to include these photos. This is a, a, a dear friend of mine, Tom Richmond. Uh, who passed away earlier this year, and and then uh, Jim Halverson from the state of Montana, but they helped me with uh, with looking at the various resources that can be available, and these are generally res available throughout every state. But you can you can see historic geophysical logs where they're available, well files, cores, a lot of information that that can really help you. And a lot of state agencies can, can work with you if, say, during plugging, you need to do some sort of controlled venting, or maybe as you're measuring methane emissions to get an idea of that, or the idea of carbon credits, uh, you need to do controlled flaring or whatever. But the states can also help you a lot with, um, with looking at uh, options for, for plugging practices and, and experiences that they've had. So please use those guys. The other thing that I'll that I'll note here is there are considerable risks. There's a lot of complications. Uh, Gene Chinney from Ohio gave me this one picture of a, a well with wooden casing. Um, I've, I've plugged one well with wooden casing uh, up in Northwest Michigan. It was a booger to find. Um, but think, thinking that a lot of these wells have been drilled in say the late 1800s or early 1900s before a lot of infrastructure was built. Some of them get built uh, over, like the, the top right was a well that the state of Ohio had to, had to plug uh, where they found an old orphan well uh, under a gymnasium floor. Uh, the bottom right was a house built over uh, a, a well in New York. Uh, in, in Indiana, I have uh, we had, I think we have some Indiana guys here, uh, but I've plugged wells in people's basements. Uh, so, you know, just keep in mind that these these can be an issue. And and in that picture where you see the welder, um, this this stuff can sometimes, you know, just provide some uh, some challenges. Is you know when you need to get, you know, you find a a, a well and you've got to get some casing on there so you can get into it for plugging operations, and yet it's leaking methane. So caution and safety is just is just huge, and and sometimes these wells, you know, we have to do offshore plugging. Sometimes we have a lake here in Oklahoma, uh, Lake Skytooth, that has 27,000 abandoned orphan wells under the waterline. So when you when you really think of the the issues that we have to deal with, they're significant. So trying to run through fast, so you know just. Just think about these conclusions. I, I hope you appreciate them. But research methodologies to locate, more fully characterize, assess risks, and manage uh, plugging and restoration operations. 
safely remain a priority. You know, groups like OERB and in, in, in a number of states have done some great things, but you know, still we get we get problems happening or wells that get plugged and they're still emitting methane or still being a problem environmentally. So, you know, we 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 need to make these a priority. So developing best practices to address those challenges, I think, is a great way to go. That's some of what uh, the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission is working on. This is just, you know, I know it's a priority with U.S. Department of Energy. That's great. Uh, as well as developing a more formal risk-based rating system, the Groundwater Protection Council is working with this on as part of the risk-based data management system. That's good. Training and information sharing workshops are needed. Um, Susan and I talked about. Uh, you know, doing some workshops through AAPG, I think we'll see that, um, you know, because addressing these old wells takes a multidisciplinary team, in my opinion. And then measuring methane emissions and developing processes for carbon credits is needed to really maximize program success. If people can, can make money to do this, uh, it's going to increase the interest in plugging these old wells. And I'll note that carbon credits from well plugging can be sold on a global market. So you can you can plug a well in the United States and get credits and sell those credits in Sweden, for instance. Uh, qualifying for credits is not limited to historic wells. It can be post-1950 wells, uh, provided it, it it meets the criteria. Uh, and and I'll say the other thing is both ongoing emissions and potential emissions, perhaps due due to equipment issues or whatever, have the ability to qualify for carbon credits. And the last thing I'll say is this. This doesn't get a lot of attention, but historical value and preservation of well sites and associated equipment is a, is a major consideration. So there's a lot of wells out there that property owners or individuals keep quiet about because they're afraid that if somebody comes in and to plug wells, that they're gonna remove all this historic equipment and just throw it in a, in a landfill. And as, I, as you saw from some of those earlier, uh, Earlier photos. This is this is major history of our industry, and, and it's I just say it's very important to a lot of people, and it's kept a lot of people quiet uh, about some of these wells. That if we could just plug the well and do something productive with the equipment, I think that would be be better. But there there's work that needs to be thought about relative to that equipment too. And then lastly, here's my contact information. So if you'd like to email me or or, or give me a call. Um, you know, I'm around, uh, I like talking, so, uh, so there we go. So, Susan, I, I got through that as quick as I can. Well, nice job. Little, and a little quick late. question, will we get credits for, um, well, anyway, um, we won't go into that. We'll have questions later. And I'd like to have Rick Fritz just say two words before we go to Bert Bugler, who's, um, going to be our next presenter. So um, this is sort of Rick's brainchild, so I'd like for him to um, say a few words. Yeah, you caught me with my mouth full, but um, anyway, <laughs> welcome everyone. Uh, you know, when we first heard about this, I, I, I'm i like, well, this is something everybody wants to do. So whether you're, you know, it's, it's kind of a nonpartisan issue. Let's Let's um, plug these wells and let's get rid of the uh, the methane emission. So it's a, a great opportunity for APG and for D, D, uh, DPA, Division of Professional Affairs of AEPG, uh, to uh, and the DEG to work with, um, you know, work with a, a variety of because uh, uh, this isn't just just science. It's a variety of professionals in this process. So we look forward to this. And thanks, Susan, for. Uh, getting this on, and thanks to the divisions for uh, sponsoring it. Great. Well, thank you, and um, keep keep um, in touch, everyone, because we will have part two, and then we will have some courses, and and then we're looking ahead to 2023 for uh, a conference. So that'll be good. And as we mentioned earlier, uh, this is partially um, sponsored by the Division of Environmental Geoscientists, and Bert Vogler is in fact a um, environmental geoscientist. So, Bert, welcome. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Let me get my screen shared.
Well, I work with a firm called Kleinfelder, which is. Oh, this is good. Oh, I think you need to go ahead and share the bigger one. Yeah, like you did before. Uh, okay. I thought that's what I was doing. Um, okay, this is good enough. This works. Um, okay, well, I think this is going to be about the best I can do. I believe I shared the wrong screen and I don't know how to switch it out. No, that's but, okay. That's fine. This yeah. is good. Anyway, I, I work for Kleinfelder. Kleinfelder is uh, an engineering science and architecture firm. And uh, we're comprised of engineers, scientists, and construction professionals who uh, provide solutions that improve our clients' transportation, water, energy, and other private infrastructure. Uh, and I'm going to talk about environmental impacts of, oil, of abandoned uh, and orphaned uh, oil and gas wells, and I'm going to touch again on the difference. Uh, orphan wells are specifically those uh, for which we don't know an owner. Uh, abandoned wells are typically uh, unproductive, but they have a known owner operator. And here's a photo of a Pennsylvania uh, uh, orphan well that had artesian flow with a hydrocarbon sheath. It was plugged subsequently by the state. Uh, what's the environmental problem with them? Uh, at least as perceived by the NRDC, they're dangerous because they leak. Among the chemicals that can seep out and contaminate air, soil or groundwater, or hydrogen sulfide, benzene and arsenic, and even small leaks can cause big problems if they go unaddressed or undetected for many years. Um, I've worked in the environmental field for about 35 years, and human health risk drivers involved with petroleum production include benzene, which can be up to 3% by weight in crude oil and condensate, typically highest in condensate. Naphthalene is one of the polynuclear aromatic hydrocarbons, or PAHs. It can be in crude at concentrations of up to uh, over a percent. There are other PAHs that are concerned, like benzoapyrene and arsenic. Uh, analysis of 53 crude samples indicated arsenic concentrations of up to over 500 milligrams per liter or parts per million, and a median concentration of a little bit under a part per million. There are other associated environmental concerns behind those, besides those human health risk drivers. There are other metals like vanadium, which is for some species an environmental toxin. Uh, there are brines that are produced with crude oil that typically have high sulfate and chloride concentrations. And as our prior speaker mentioned, uh, methane, which is produced with crude is both a, a potential greenhouse gas, it's a potent greenhouse gas, and also an explosive hazard. Uh, touching on how many orphaned oil and gas wells there are in the U.S., uh, Reuters 2020 investigation uh, said uh, there's over 3.2 million orphan plus abandoned oil and gas wells, uh, and they said Pennsylvania has over 330,000 of them. Pretty astounding. Uh, mapping uh, orphaned uh, Wells, uh, again, our prior speaker mentioned this EDF and McGill University study. Uh, they developed a geolocated data set using state reported data and orphan wells. Specifically, they identified over 81,000 of them in 28 states, uh, especially dense uh, in Appalachia, the industrial Midwest, the Southern Plains into the Western Gulf area and in urban Southern California, where I live. And significantly, EDF calculated there are about 9 million Americans that live within a mile of an orphan well. Uh, this is that uh, map that EDF and McGill prepared. And again, you can see it backs up what was stated in the text of that last slide. And uh, on this slide, I've placed on the left a USGS map of principal aquifers in the US. 
And on the right, the uh, orphan oil and gas map location uh, map. And you can see just visually comparing these two maps, a lot of these orphan oil and gas wells uh, are right where there are principal aquifers. How do these wells leak? Here's a schematic cross section of an abandoned well. Uh, the red arrows are potential leakage, path leakage pathways. CL is cap leakage. OSCL is outside of the surface casing leakage. Starting at the bottom of the well, uh, you can have leakage from your target formation along or uh, uh, through your uh, production casing cement. You can have leakage here through uh, a cemented intermediate through uh, formation. Uh, you can have uh, cement uh, through non-cemented zones into uh, intermediate formations. Uh, you can have leakage uh, beyond and uh, up the casing around the casing shoe. And then you can have uh, plug failure and cap leakage. Uh, some examples of obvious surface impact. Here's uh, two examples of New York state wells that were subsequently plugged and abandoned by the state. And you can see the uh, clear indications of hydrocarbon impact. Uh, crude oil leaking uh, from the one on the right and obvious crude staining from the one on the left. Uh, I'll touch on three Pennsylvania examples. Uh, here was an abandoned gas well leaking a petroleum sheen before it was plugged by the state. Uh, here's an abandoned well at the bottom of the photo that had a wooden conductor casing. It was releasing acid drainage into a creek prior to it being plugged. And uh, this third well, uh, it was found when uh, they traced crude oil emanating from a shale outcropping within a stream channel up gradient to the location of the well. And it also was plugged and abandoned by the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, Kleinfelder does some work in Colorado and uh, these aren't orphan wells. These were uh, abandoned by their operators and Kleinfelder performed uh, soil sampling during the uh, abandonment work. These are photos from a couple of our sites. Uh, the approach that we use, the wells themselves are identified by the operator, they're cut and capped. Uh, we screen soil around these former wellheads using fuel increments for uh, organic vapors, and we sample the soil at about two feet deep. We submit the samples for laboratory analysis of contaminants uh, uh, per state requirements. We compare the analytical results to the state's allowable thresholds, and if the soil exceeds them, it's treated, and we then resample it following treatment. And once the results are below contaminant thresholds, the site undergoes final reclamation. Okay, I'm gonna spend the rest of the talk focusing on California, where I live. Here's a EDF McGill's map of California showing documented orphan wells. Uh, and again, you can see there's a lot of them in the Great Basin and a huge number of them down in the coastal Southern California area. Uh, by county, the 10 counties with the uh, highest number of these wells on the right, by far the largest majority are in LA County. Uh, there's also quite a few though in Santa Barbara, Ventura, Orange and Kern County. Um, California's state agency with jurisdiction on oil and gas wells is our Division of Geologic Energy Management, known as CalGEM. And CalGEM acknowledges that these deteriorating wells can be conduits for hydrocarbons, uh, lead, salt, sulfates, and other contaminants to access and enter fresh water aquifers. And in addition, these contaminants pose surface risks to surface water, uh, air quality, soils, and vegetation. Um, and they pose a threat to underground sources of drinking water. CalGEM has an idle well program to identify and seal idle wells. Again, recognizing that uh, these wells may provide pathways for contaminant migration. In California, CalGEM defines an idle well as one that hasn't been used for two years or more, and it's not been properly plugged and abandoned. 
and our state requires these idle oil and gas wells to be tested and if warranted repaired or some permanently sealed and closed. Um, and plugging and abandonment of them involves uh, sealing them permanently with cement plugs to isolate the uh, hydrocarbon bearing formation from shallower water sources and to prevent leakage to the surface. And if a well, uh, 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 the owner becomes insolvent or deserts the well, then uh, the state may step in and accept responsibility for sealing it. And since, since 1997, our state has plugged and abandoned about 1,400 of these wells at a cost of uh, upwards of $30 million. I'm gonna end the talk focusing on uh, three sites uh, that I've worked on uh, during my career with Kleinfelder. This first one uh, was an abandoned oil production site uh, that was known as the Boneyard in Culver City, not far from uh, LA proper. A couple of photographs, one at ground level showing some uh, abandoned storage tanks on the property, and then one from up the hill showing uh, the uh, production area and uh, uh, just staining and whatnot down there. It was within the Inglewood oil field. There were three wells, still are abandoned at various times, 10 above ground storage tanks, a former oil water separator, settling tank and pumps, uh, above ground and buried piping and uh, some apparent oil seeps, uh, one visible on the right there. At that site, uh, we performed a site investigation under EPA and LA County Fire Department oversight. We drilled and sampled 33 soil bores sampling at minimum five foot intervals. And the county required us to go 20 feet beneath the base of obvious petroleum impact. Uh, we had our soil samples analyzed for full carbon range, total petroleum hydrocarbons, for VOCs, for semi-VOCs, for PAHs and metals. And we installed and sampled soil vapor probes and had our vapor samples analyzed for methane, hydrogen sulfide, and VOCs. We used the results to perform a human health risk assessment. Uh, in conclusion, based on our findings, we identified widespread hydrocarbon contamination in the shallow soil. It warranted remediation, but it had a very limited vertical extent, about five feet or so. So we prepared a cleanup plan that was eventually approved by the US EPA and by the county. And uh, we performed a cleanup involving uh, removal of about 600 linear feet of abandoned cast iron piping that was decontaminated and hauled off to be recycled. We excavated 1,200 tons of petroleum impacted soil with concentrations in cases well above 1,000 parts per million. And we had that hauled off site for treatment and recycling. We collected and analyzed 86 confirmation soil samples. Uh, bottom line was we obtained no further action for the site. It's use as a dog park was approved and here it is after uh, the dog park was constructed on a nice Southern California cloudy day. Uh, another site uh, where oil well re-abandonment was triggered by proposed construction of a commercial building addition. Uh, there were two wells there. Uh, Kleinfelder reviewed uh, California file records for both wells. We coordinated a geophysical survey to locate the buried wells. We excavated both the wellheads and we did testing directly for methane leakage. And here are the two exposed wellheads. You can see the one on the left prior to re-abandonment had been abandoned with uh, uh, a pole, a wooden pole. Uh, the one on the right had at least been cemented. But because our records review indicated the abandonments didn't meet current state requirements, we had to re-abandon both wells. And once they were re-abandoned, uh, we had to place methane vent cones, the concrete vent cones atop them, and we had to extend riser piping to the surface to vent methane should they ever start leaking methane. 
And as you can see, one of these two wells was right adjacent to the building addition. Uh, the final example site, a uh, client proposed to install a gasoline station at an existing retail store on a property that had a plugged and abandoned oil well. And our historic research indicated it also had two above ground petroleum storage tanks that were long gone. So we again reviewed state file records and we did a geophysical survey to locate the buried well. And we did a phase two environmental site assessment of the proposed gasoline station and the former tank locations. Uh, we installed six soil bores, sampled soil in them, installed and sampled uh, some triple nested soil vapor probes, analyzed our soil samples for TPH and VOCs, and the soil vapor probe samples for methane and for VOCs. And we again excavated the wellhead, performed testing of it for methane leakage, and we observed placement of a vent cone over the well. Uh, we identified hydrocarbon impacted soil that had to be dealt with uh, where the tanks had been during uh, the construction work. We uh, had to do VOC contaminated soil monitoring pursuant to our air quality management district's requirements, and we collected soil samples of the excavated soil and profiled it for disposal. Um, in parting, some uh, tips and recommendations. It's important to review historic uh, information regarding locations of the, the wells and other features of related environmental concern, things like former impoundments, mud pits, tanks, pipelines, and you wanna focus your initial soil investigation on those areas and then do step out sampling as required. You need to understand your characterization requirements of uh, the state and local agencies. If a large area needs investigations, consider using high resolution site characterization. Uh, at sites where uh, there's shallow groundwater or the groundwater is being used for uh, a drinking water, you need to sample it for the presence of dissolved phase uh, hydrocarbons and dissolved constituents. You should be aware of the many variations in TPH analysis and their effect on the meaning of your TPH results. And you need to understand your environmental risk drivers and risk considerations. And there's my contact information. That's great. Really appreciate that. I see some hands raised. Um, if you have a question, please put it in the chat box. We're going to, to have a question and answer at the very end. We really want to get through the, the content. And there was a general question. Will you get a recording of the, this meeting? And the answer is yes, you will receive an email with the recording, a link to the recording. And also I'll put in a link if you need um, professional development hours. There's a little charge of that, that, that this is, um, that obviously this is free and we're looking forward to future events. So anyway, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, um, Dennis Wiles, and I'd like to invite you to, to just go ahead and, and, and talk to us about your experiences Dennis is with New Point Energy, and he and his company have, have had the chance to plug many wells, and so he's going to talk about his personal experience. Welcome. Uh, again, I'm with New Point Energy, and we're a plugging contractor. Uh, the last several years, we've been plugging primarily for the Ohio Orphan Well Program, and I want to talk a little bit about our experiences program. Um, they've really expanded it a lot in the last several years since 2018 uh, when their legislation was passed to increase their funding from 14 percent to 30 percent of the oil and gas severance tax. So the result is in 2022 their budget was 22.5 million dollars in their uh, regular program and that will be in addition to the federal funds that Ohio's and that is the gradually going to step up every year as they've developed a long-term plan to address these orphan wells. Um, 
they've also increased their staff. They have a full team of engineers, surveyors, geologists, uh, radioactive team, inspectors, accounting, and administrative staff specifically allocated to the orphan one. And um, one thing I want to talk to you about on radioactive is something that maybe a lot of states aren't doing. Uh, before any thing that's pulled from underground tubulars, casing, et cetera, uh, it's all tested for radioactivity before it leaves the site and is put on containment. And I think there are several things that the Ohio program is doing that uh, many other states will adopt as uh, this orphan well um, programs get developed federally and at the state level. Um, Ohio historic wells, they think they've drilled somewhere between 220 to 275,000 wells. And many of those were prior to 1930. Um, so there aren't a complete set of records on those. And uh, a lot of times when we go into plug a project, we're using offset wells data that is the best we can get to know what to um, they only have 20,000 wells listed on the orphan well list now, but it's estimated that well over 100,000 in the state of Ohio alone exist. Uh, and it's unknown how many unproperly plugged wells are out there in addition to that. Um, the Ohio program is a little different than a lot of states have been doing in the past. They are, have treated it more like a large scale public works program. Um, similar to what you'd see in road construction. Um, they start out with the UPC exploratory uh, contract, which I've done. This will be the third year that our company's doing the one of the exploratory. What they do there is if they have a call in an emergency, they have contractors in place that go out and address the immediate leak, get the well under control, and uh, do some investigation prior to plugging. So um, we'll actually go in and do some site work, some clearing, uh, excavate the wellheads, uh, and put some degree of well control on it, try to get the leaks under control, get them stopped, uh, caliper casings, a lot of times run downhole cameras, or at the very least a slick line to measure total depths and try to determine what types of obstructions and tubulars are in the wells. And uh, that's really helpful. That's uh, helped to control a lot of the bidding process because prior to that, you could only go to a pre-bid meeting and see uh, what you could see from the surface. A lot of times there wasn't any other information available. And uh, it's, it's helped a lot with the contractors being able to determine a little bit more as to what they might expect as far as obstructions and casings and things like that. Also, they have a, the means to address leaks and other concerns more rapidly. Um, in addition to that, they do a complete site investigation. They have surveyors come out and they do topos and a complete survey of the area. They develop detailed engineering plans and including the site access, restoration, erosion controls, and on uh, deeper holes or things where there's pressure concerns, they even detail out the wellhead control procedure on the wells, including uh, volume of kill water, secondary containments, uh, blowout preventers, uh, you name it. Um, and there's a lot of concern as far as traffic controls and erosion control methods. We had put silt fence on practically every project, and there's some degree of site work and erosion uh, control on almost everything else as well. Uh, on the current project that we're working on right now, you may see that I'm in a hotel room. We're just moving in uh, to a new location in Southern Ohio this week. And um, we were in the hilly area and there's a lot of erosion control concerns on that. Uh, we're putting in culverts and uh, riprap 
channel protection. Uh, we'll use a lot of rig mats and certainly a lot of silk fence. And um, also we treat traffic control very seriously. Uh, we'll have flaggers and uh, a lot of times uh, they'll have uh, other traffic control devices on site just for equipment moving in and out. And I think that's where we're headed with everything as they're stepping up these processes to get it a little more streamlined into uh, a more modern approach to uh, than what a lot of smaller operators are used to. Um, they prioritize the wells that we're going to move on to primarily based on the need. So they, the greatest risk is addressed first. As a result, we're working on a lot of historical wells that um, may have a lot of construction problems and they're leaking, they're under or next to buildings, they're in waterways, they're under roadways, underneath high tension power lines. Uh, as a lot of these wells were drilled pre-1930, uh, everything's been developed around them with very little uh, concern for the wells themselves. You, you can't believe the number of wells that people built houses over top of and built schools over top of them. We worked on a project last year where brine water was leaking into a tributary that was going to a lake. On that project, we brought a crane in and laid out over top of the uh, waterway so that we could work on this well. Uh, there was no casing. And a lot of these historic wells in Ohio, that's what they've, they've done. The previous operators pulled the casing to reuse it and they set the tubing on a packer. And if you're lucky, they backfilled it with fire clay. A lot of times, nothing. So the result is a lot of these wells are leaking. And on this project, the tubing was bent over and in the middle of this tributary going into the lake and it was leaking brine water pretty significantly. So we went in and drove casing over the top of it to try to get wellhead control as quickly as we could. And uh, then we had to straighten the tubing and wash down inside the tubing with one inch to bottom to pump a bottom plug. Um, unfortunately, the tubing was so bent, we still could not get logging tools down it. So we washed over the outside with four and a half inch casing uh, and power swivel drilled down to uh, plugging depth and plugged on the outside as well. And then uh, pulled whatever casing we could till it um, These wells, the historic wells create a huge amount of challenges. And uh, I think that's what we're gonna see with the federal funds coming into play uh, I think we'll see that they're going to move on to some of the easier projects as well, but there is just a tremendous number of uh, these old historical wells that have little to no control on them whatsoever, and they're leaking. We, we do a lot of site restoration and uh, contaminated material disposal where just decades and decades of these wells leak. That was helpful. I think that's the end of my presentation. That was great. I think it's really useful to, to hear these in the field examples and understanding exactly what happens. This really highlights the need for an understanding of materials science and cementing. And to that end, we have Mileva uh, Radonjic, who's here. So, hi, Mileva. Hi, Susan. I'd like, like to invite you to talk about what you do and your background and some of your thoughts about this. You'll be presenting more in depth in our part two in November. Yeah. So since we're kind of almost out of uh, our hour for today, I, I would just like to kind of uh, uh, mentioned briefly uh, the 
this is a topic that I will presenting in your uh, part two uh, webinar uh, sometime later. Um, basically, I think I started, I was thinking as I was listening to previous presenters, um, I think in 2003, so almost 20 years ago, I first encountered the topic of leaky wells and, and how to deal with them when I joined the uh, Princeton Carbon Mitigation Initiative that was a project sponsored by BP and Ford at the time. And pretty quickly we realized that what we use as a traditional material to construct well bores, which is a Portland cement, is really not meant for a long-term use. Uh, it works well in you know 30 years or so, uh, which is what is needed for the production. And, and even then there are sometimes issues. Uh, can we place cement properly, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, as previous uh, speakers also mentioned, uh, we've, we've come a long way, like what was acceptable 100 or 50 years ago is no longer acceptable today. Um, also, there is a sheer number of wells that we have to deal with. Um, but I also learned another thing, um, that all science that can happen in a lab, whether practical experiments or modeling, um, it really makes not much use if we do not engage uh, the practitioners, which is industry and the regulatory agencies. So. It needs to be somehow communicated uh, and and to engage everyone uh, who really has a stake in this. So I hope that uh, we can make a progress in, in that area. Um, some highlights from my 20 year uh, involvement in this topic. Uh, in 2019, SP had a, a PNA um, forum uh, in the Netherlands and I was part of, of that. And, and one kind of important uh, conclusion from that meeting was that um, throughout the history, really the, the people in charge of abandoning uh, wells and plugging them and abandoning uh, technology are people who are primarily trained uh, on how to drill and complete wells. And that we realize we really need to also invest time and resources in development of a new workforce. So people who are going to look at these materials issues and how we do this effectively for, you know, whether you, you believe that we should plug in a banner for 10,000 years, or we're talking, you know, a more like a geology time. Um, that, that expertise is not like quite there. And, and so, Industry admitted that this is uh, this is a major need. So um, I've done like a couple of projects. Uh, one was sponsored by the uh, Shell EMP, where we looked at what can we do with existing wells to actually um, mitigate the leakage that is there. And this is through some tubular expandable technologies, and I will talk about that uh, uh, in the, in the part two of this series. Um, and more recently, um, I had a project that was sponsored by the National Academy of Science, uh, Engineering and Math, uh, the GRP program for the Gulf Research Program. And that involved several institutions here in the US, as well as a, a laboratory over from Norway uh, called Sintef. Uh, I'm very impressed with uh, how Norway is dealing with, with this topic. I think they're probably the leader. And so I was really looking forward to learning from them and including them in, in our uh, project. And that proved to be very uh, actually useful and effective partnership with uh, publications and lots of people now being trained on this topic. Uh, and what this conclusion there is that uh, we can really do better if we try and tweak cement as is towards something that more replicates uh, natural materials, uh, in this case, rocks and minerals. So there are plenty of advances in uh, material science, whether you look at uh, NASA or, or something closer to home, like civil engineering, um, that, uh, that really haven't made the cross to uh, oil and gas, and in this particular case, PNA. So I think I will stop with that. This is just like a little, um, few highlights of what I would like to talk next time. Thank you, Susan. Well, that's great. So I'd like to open up the um, 
The floor to questions and answers. I've, I've collected them from the chat. So I'll just start with the oldest first, first one first. <laughs> and anybody who would like to answer of our, our um, participants, please um, open your mic and just feel free to jump in. So first of all, um, can, can anyone comment on what is the process to document and register and allocate, allocate carbon credits from these wells? So Dan, would you like to take that? Hey Susan, I'll, I can I can take that. There's um, there's a few different uh, methodologies here um, and that that have been used. People like the Well Done Foundation and others have have tried to develop things for some of these old wells. It gets more complicated uh, when you look at what that potential to emit or potential is. So. It can really vary, so I, I would say that if you if you want more information on that, I'd say contact me directly, uh, because it can it can really vary depending on the situation of the well. Does the well have casing? Is it a newer well? Is it a you know? I mean, just there, there's a pretty broad variety. And I think following up on that, there was like, can we get credits? I'm assuming this means carbon credits for plugging and abandoning any oil and gas well. And if so, what are the criteria? So it really depends. So it has to be has to be uh, a well that uh, that there's not a responsible party for. So if you know if an operator owns a well that you know um, that temporarily abandons it or you know leaves it, and they have responsibility and it's bonded. Uh, you can't get credits for that. So these are these, you know, orphan and abandoned wells. So orphan wells, there's no owner. It's 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 you know, there's nothing there. Or an abandoned well that has no active owner, no bonding. Uh, it's just it's just left there. So. Now I think that the there is an owner, but the owner becomes the state by default, right? Well, essentially, yes. <laughs> I mean, and, just, and there's a, there's even some cases I'll say that uh, in in some of the newer wells where uh, companies have gone into abandoned wells, mostly post 1950, and actually turned them back on production. But even some older wells. So you think about this, you know, 50 or 100 years ago, a well was producing 10 barrels of oil a day, or or 100 MCF of gas maybe. Uh, it just wasn't economic. Uh, and today, if you had a well that's producing 10 barrels of oil a day, it, you know, that's, that's a great thing. So we've seen even some of these being reactivated. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, exactly. And then what we'll get into next time too, and I know that EMD, our, one of our divisions, and Mike Bingle Davis, who's the president of Energy Minerals is here. We had an interesting discussion yesterday um, about before totally plugging and abandoning, identifying co-production or other opportunities like um, brine mining or geothermal or uh, converting it to geothermal, even even desalination for if there's a brine layer low. So we've we've looked at this. So there's there's even more than that. So uh, yes. you look at say Lower Arkansas. Um, there's uh, there's work going on there on uh, lithium mining uh, in some of the old uh, you know oil reservoirs that were used there that 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 may have five six hundred uh, you know parts per million lithium in it so you know the smack over is being targeted for just that as well as areas like in in, in California and so forth but uh, the, one of the challenges when you look at these older wells for CCS or some of the other things is is oftentimes the well construction uh, doesn't meet the standards that you would need. So you've got to be really careful. It may offer you an opportunity, but you may have to go do considerable repair or something. So that's a good point. And Mike, would you like to jump in? So we talked about like well integrity yesterday. He's sure. from the Rocky perspective. 
Yeah, um, I just wanted to say that, you know, a lot of these cases are wells that are obviously old, you know, or they are um, truly orphan wells where you don't know their history or what's going on inside. And those are the wells that, you know, most without question should just be plugged and abandoned. But like we discussed, it, it'd be nice to have sort of a, a checklist that a company or a state agency goes through while in the process to collect data that would be beneficial to alternate energies or resources that might be uh, subsurface that would allow them to kind of quantify something prior to plugging and uh, losing the ability to sample at a particular level. That's great. Yeah. So, so Mike, I'll say this is that is follow what the Groundwater Protection Council is doing, uh, where they're they're adding some of the details uh, to orphan and abandoned wells to the risk-based data management system. Um, so they're trying to consider some of those risks and prioritizing and so forth. Well, that's Thank good. You. Great. Um, this looks like a potential question for Bert. Increasingly, fiber optic. Optics are being used for integrity measurements. Has it been considered to use these wells as future sensors? In other words, deploy a fiber uh, in cement. This would enable monitoring potential leaks, but also monitoring for seismic activity. As we move into CCUS, CCS and old fields, these wells could be an opportunity to monitor permanently and get added value. Yeah, I'm unaware of any current uses of fiber optics for that, but it's kind of an interesting suggestion. Um, I don't know if you could use fiber optics to, uh, you know, kind of monitor some integrity over time. That's not something that I'm well, I, that I have really knowledge about, but it's an interesting uh, question. Yeah. Yeah, maybe Maleva knows. Okay. So, so what I'll, so I'll, I'll hop in here is um, for some of these wells, we've actually put in uh, seismic monitors. Um, but if you look at companies like Schlumberger, they're, uh, they they have technology now using fiber optics with um, temperature and audio uh, collect continuous collection through that, and and that can be real helpful at identifying well integrity where fluids are going. Uh, in and outside of that casing. So it's certainly a possibility. The problem with that technology right now is it's very expensive. Well, that makes sense. Um, Mileva, would you like to jump in since you're talking? Uh, I was just going to add that um, there is definitely potential there. A cost is, uh, is one issue. Uh, the other issue is that uh, you would still have to um, Refigure these wells. You cannot simply just go and you know <laughs> uh, stick some probes and it would work because uh, the topic that we're Amen. talking about today requires, I think, lots of um, uh, re uh, you know workovers and 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 really bringing it to the standard of um, wellbore construction that we have today. So that would be my first step before thinking about how to use them for any monitoring or uh, things like that. Well, that makes sense. Let's go on to our next question. Great answers and, and wonderful questions as well. Um, how would someone go about getting an initial or rudimentary idea of emission rates, volumes of a well, to determine the risk or reward of taking on a project? Well, this sounds like a question for Dennis. What are some typical measurement methods required by government agencies? Would you like to tackle that, Dennis? Well, I'll, I'll try. I don't know if I can answer this one properly, but um, they're doing a lot of things now to try to quantify um, gas leaks. And for that, reason, as I understand it, a lot of the carbon credits are, are going to be based on quantifying um, the amount of gas that's being leaked out of these wells. Uh, Dan, can you confirm that that is right? 
That that's right. And and I would just say that um, you know, like you, the use of a FLIR camera mm -hmm. is a great way to 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 do uh, like kind of a preliminary assessment, and, and, then and you it might, doesn't measure volume. You might mention that that's uh, infrared. Pardon? Yeah, you might mention it and describe what it's like. Yeah, camera. yeah, it's, a, it's an infrared camera, but and 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 it doesn't it doesn't measure a a volume or rate, but but you can you know given enough comparisons, and that's that's what we try to do is is you can tell if something is you know a lot or a little or or whatever. So those are just instrumental in trying to identify that, and even maybe prioritizing some of the the higher emitting wells as opposed to the lower emitting wells. Well, you just, answered the, you just answered the next question, I believe. Given the sheer number of orphan wells and the amount of work required for proper abandonment, has there been any effort to rank the wells to get those emitting the most methane or with the biggest environmental or safety issues plugged first? I'll comment on that. I know in the state of Ohio that that is absolutely what they do. Um, they have a ranking system that is quantifying what they believe is the greatest risk. That's what they have been going after. Mileva, would you like to? Oh. Yeah, can I no, I was really actually, I wanted to ask maybe a question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so there was a, this really provoking uh, uh, little survey at the well board integrity meeting that just happened last week in, you know in the netherlands and people were at the attendants were asked like okay what would be acceptable leakage level for you and it kind of uh, really shows like how differently we still think about it you know it went from zero to you know whatever economically makes sense you know if i can pay my leakage then you know i'm okay so uh, I was wondering, uh, is there something that is happening on a federal level or is this still state by state of how is ranked what is bad leakage versus what is acceptable or? I'll, I'll say this is the US Department of Energy has done a lot of work with this and is funding. They're, they're the ones that the, the federal government is funding you know, up to $25 million per year per state. Uh, but they've done also a lot of work on looking at and, and seeing, you know, like just overall, how many wells are high emitters versus no emitters or low emitters or moderate. So there's been a lot of work done on that. So I'd encourage you to, to look to the uh, DOE, uh, NETL uh, for some of that. Um, you know, David Alleman would be a good contact at DOE to, to dig into some of that. Um, but, but I'd say with this, there's, there's a lot of work that's going on with the states, with DOE federally, with EPA, uh, other groups like the Environmental Defense Fund, uh, the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission is doing a lot of great stuff. So is the Groundwater Protection Council. So there's, there's a lot of overreaching things that are, that are federal, multi-state, uh, and, and more. So lots, really lots going on here. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So um, the Osage um, said, uh, there's a comment and I'd like to encourage um, William Little or Bill Little to, to t talk about this if you're still here. Um, Osage has had an orphan well program for years. We are forming a non-profit for carbon management. Is anyone still on, on the call that would like to respond to that? So um, while we go wait for the- I'll, I'll, say, I'll say that there's, that on an overall basis, um, there's, you're gonna see a lot more nonprofits that go there. One of the, the key drivers with that is with the 45Q tax credits and, and so forth, if you are a for-profit company, um, you are you're limited to getting carbon credits for this kind of work. If you're a nonprofit, you can actually get tax credits and even immediate tax credit payments. So the idea of, of a nonprofit is 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 pretty significant 
uh, in this, and, and you'll see more of these organizations coming up and partnering maybe with plugging companies and other groups and, and, uh, and, and using the registry so that they can, they can get credit for that and, and get a tax credit as opposed to just a carbon credit. Great. Well, so we have time for one or two more questions that I've got people have um, typed in, but I'd like to ask everyone to take a moment to find the chat and to, to type in your top two or three uh, favorites for topics for future webinars for the DEG and also the Division of Professional Affairs. So, uh, and if you want more of this, we will have one more um, of this topic. So here's another question. Is anyone using very high resolution optical satellites that have NIR and SWIR capabilities for near infrared and anyway, for assisting in precise location, environmental contamination and vegetation condition characterization on and near well sites? Okay, this is Joseph Ward. The federal okay. government has, has 17 satellites that transverse the US, particularly the, uh, the offshore Gulf of Mexico on a daily basis. Half of those have FLIR capacity and uh, they can identify uh, an all sheet uh, down to one ounce. Um, so the, um, the answer would be yes, you, they can see and they've identified, Langley, Virginia has identified almost all of the natural seats and all of the, um, uh, the other uh, uh, emissions throughout the United States through the satellite method. How do you get access to them? Uh, that's another another issue entirely. Um, I, we did have earlier a few um, presentations by LG Harris. They um, they they were they had some satellites and then a couple of other satellite companies. Um, I'll try to find the the links to those recordings and I'll send them in an email. But uh, we have archived. Them and they they've done a lot of work. They especially in in like you said exactly what you're saying. Those are the, the ones I'm mentioning are are not um, um, governmental satellites. I guess they're paid for by the government anyway. There was also an example of using satellites to uh, detect uh, issues like this when uh, uh, BP was doing uh, carbon inje uh, CO2 injection in Insala in Algeria. So I think it can be done, uh, but I think you, you bring a good uh, uh, observation there, like the cost and who owns it and, and all that. <clears throat> right. Yeah. And there... Um, it just depends on what access to which bands and all that makes a difference. Um, okay, what are generally the top three line item costs in identifying an orphan or abandoned well, abandoning it and reclaiming the surface area? I'll take that. Um, it really varies greatly on the site and the well. Um, it, it's really hard to say generally. Uh, there's many projects where we have had um, the bulk of the money and reclamation and removing contaminated soils, which is very costly. And if you have a large leak for a long, long period of time, um, that, that can really exponentially get out of control in our you just don't know and you start digging into it and um yeah, it's amazing how far oil and brine water will travel through the ground um and, uh, other, and gas yeah and, and other projects, uh traffic control is one of them. and and also if you get into, uh, you're next to a building or have to tear down part of a building, I mean, the construction costs your driver. So very often the well plugging itself is not the greatest expense in a lot of the 
And I wanted to make another comment about the flare camera as a useful tool um, while I'm on here. We have a project where uh, after we had pumped a plug, we still, uh, the next day we had gas bubbling up. And I suspected it was coming around the annulus of the casing. But uh, the quantity was so little that we couldn't really determine where it was coming from. But with the flare camera, we could see that it was coming around the case. So then we drilled it back out and casing up and we got it stopped. So it is a very useful tool. It's really interesting. Well, if we have any the, other- The problem is the flare cameras cost about $80,000. Really? I had, well, I, okay, that gets to the drones. Let's like, okay, so because a lot of FLIR cameras, you can get for, I don't know, I don't think they're, I mean, they're they're used in security and, and also for other types of um, detection of heat. But I don't know if you, you can get some for several hundred dollars that do the basics, but I don't know if they would work for this. I guess the answer is no. <laughs> Not enough resolution. And Susan, also like um, the problem with uh, with that is like if we are talking about contamination of subsurface, for example, then uh, you know that can go on and we don't even know about it. Mm -hmm. That's a good point, and I think that what happens a lot of times too, in, in terms of drone imagery and using surface imaging is that vegetation is used as a proxy for contamination. So vegetation changes. Well, that ch changes over seasons. So you, you can't just say, okay, one, one, one look, it takes a, a, an involved study of each uh, of the seasonal variations to make sure that you're actually teasing out what's actually happening. Is it drought or is it contamination? <laughs> or is it winter or is it contamination? Um, so anybody have any, I'd like to take a moment to invite the audience to open up your mics if you would like to ask a final few little questions and or make some comments. Uh, hey, Susan, Kevin Strunk here. I, I wanted to make a point on carbon credits. There's, here in Indiana, we're just getting started on our, our thing, but. There's a company, an environmental consulting company out of Chicago that did something kind of interesting there. They directly contracted with the state of Indiana. I'm not contracted, but made an agreement to plug eight wells. They're paying for the plugging cost and they're se via selling tax credits, carbon credits. And it's kind of an interesting pilot project they're doing. So it's free to the state. They're paying for it. They hired a geologist, not me, unfortunately, but to help them identify these wells. And they're plugging eight wells down the Illinois Basin uh, in Indiana, um, using using the proceeds from them selling these carbon credits to whoever they sold them to. It's kind of an interesting approach. Now they're making money on the deal. So what the markup is, I don't know, but it's it's a um, a um, uh, a multiple of the actual plugging costs that the state would have paid. And I thought that was an interesting project. And maybe that's something that can be used elsewhere on a kind of a boutique thing. But I just thought I'd mention that. That's great. Yeah, no, it's, that's it's, really It's good. an important deal. And I'll say one more thing, Kevin, is that what we're seeing is because equipment is in such uh, short supply, demand is so high. So what we're seeing is on some of the plug jobs and, you know, and, and Dennis may have seen this, but, but, you know, getting, you know, six bucks a foot for tubing that you're pulling out of a well uh, and, and other equipment. So, so what we're seeing is that if say the plugging contractor can take ownership of that, uh, of that equipment, tubulars and so forth, he may be able to get paid for plugging the well and, and make a profit from selling some of that equipment. So there's there's a lot of things out there that I think will hopefully inspire more wells to get plugged as we go forward. 
Well, I, I love that. that quickly. <laughs> um, the state of Ohio and Indiana as well, I think probably a lot of other states uh, require that the states be reimbursed salvage material. And uh, the result is there's no incentive for us to try to get the best deal we can get for that equipment. And uh, very often it's cheaper and easier just to send it to the um, salvage. So it's a shame, but just the way the law is written, it's hard for us to uh, make a profit on spending time. Well, Dennis's audio kind of went out. Would you like to repeat your last few sentence words? Uh, yeah, the requirements from uh, a lot of the state and federal organizations is that the they're reimbursed for salvage material disposal. And uh, as a result, we, we have no real avenue to make a profit on that. And what's happening is there's no real incentive for us to try to market those materials. And um, a lot of it is just cheaper for us to send it to um, salvage disposal and, and, and a lot of that stuff's not getting reused. Oh, wow. Well, these are good. This has really been a wonderful uh, webinar. I just want to thank our presenters and want to thank also, um, Hannes Lantaru and, and Rick Fritz for being on, and, and also Andrea Reynolds, who couldn't be here, but she's the president of, of DPA this year. So, um, and I also want to thank Mike Bingle Davis, president of, of EMD, and, and of course, Hannes was the president of, of DEG. And stay tuned for next time. Also, keep an eye out for an email that will be coming your way with the links and information. So thank you, everyone. Could I add something, Susan? I can't tell. Absolutely. Oh, good, good. You can hear me. Yeah, this is Al Lanero in Florida. Uh, we, we um, as you know, there's going to be about seven to eight billion dollars spent on this, about seven to eight billion. The first half billion has already been awarded by the uh, Department uh, of, in, of Interior. There's a lot of money in there, in here, and uh, uh, there are a lot of weaknesses as far as shortages of hydrogeologists and geologists to uh, to do this kind of work. And a lot of it is connecting to see who are who the people are that are going to be the contractors and uh, getting involved with them so that they do a good job uh, plugging plugging and abandoning these wells uh, as they as they should be. And then the second thing about the about the equipment or about the uh, tubulars and the like that could be pulled out, we uh, spoke with the DOI and they said that any the value of any tubulars or any any salvageable thing, they said the state could keep the money as long as the money was then used for more plugging and abandonment. So there is some incentive. To, uh, to keep track of it and figure out if it can be sold because that could, pro that could turn out to be additional funds available for, uh, for more contracts. So I, uh, the, the, the last thing is this thing was called the Investment in Jobs uh, Act. Uh, and uh, they want to put people back to work, and that includes geologists, that includes uh, anybody that was hurt by recent recessions or low oil prices uh, and such. And um, it's called uh, something like Title VI methane control. That's actually what it's called. So uh, I don't know if uh, too many of, of the people on this, on this uh, webinar get to hear the kind of the inside of how all this is being approached but uh, if you have any questions you know give me a call and so forth there's a lot of money there a lot of employment opportunities and contacts well, well that's great we'll put your contact information in the chat cool. and i will um so everybody grab that while, while we're still on 
we're out of our time commitment, so I'm going to stop recording. And I'm also going to thank everyone again and just um, <laughs> looking forward to the future. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, everybody.